I'm interviewing Cheryl Mers today. She wanted to be a writer as a teen. It took her 50 years to get started, and she's been making up for lost time ever since. She's written 27 and a half novels, and I want to hear the story of the half, a handful of nonfiction books, and countless words on social media. When she's not writing, she enjoys hiking near her Colorado home, listening to live music, and of course, reading. Welcome, Cheryl Mers. So Cheryl, what is the story of you starting writing? Why did it take 50 years? Well, um, <laughs> 50 years ago, we didn't have the internet. Uh, Self-publishing was not uh, easy. It had gone to traditional publishing. And like many writers, I am very critical of my own work. So I, I went to school, I went to college, majored in English, got my MRS degree, um, raised my children, had some careers along the way, and then I found myself in a position where I had uh, plenty of time on my hands and uh, no income. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I basically put my profile up on uh, what was then Odesk, now Upwork, and met a gentleman who pretty soon began to use all of my time. <laughs> so it's, it just grew from there. Very good. And what's the, what kind of novels or books do you write? Well, under my own pen name, I've written a few romance novels. Mm -hmm. um, I've written some, a couple of sea adventures for another client. But my major client, with whom I've been working for the past almost five years, um, has created series of archaeological mysteries with a little bit of speculative fiction mixed in. I've written all, almost all of his books, 14 of them. Okay. And that's where the half comes in. We're halfway through with the last, with the one I'm working on now. Oh, I understand. Okay. So what got you into romance? A, a laziness. <laughs> 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 I, I hate to admit it, but um, I did a little research after realizing that I, I could be quite prolific. I write very fast. Um, I did a little research on what was the biggest market with the least amount of research to do because I had quite a bit of the latter to do for my, uh, my client. And uh, romance was it. Uh, at the time, it was pretty wide open. Um, I met some people online who achieve success, quite, quite generous success financially with their first books. So I jumped into the fray and um, I sold some books. I sold a respectable amount of books. Um, however, I was working 14 hours a day, sometimes writing up to three novels at the same time. And, um, you know, 10 to 11,000 words a day, it was just not sustainable. So uh, something came along that stopped me from writing my last book, and um, I went to ghostwriting full-time. Okay, so you're a ghostwriter. I am a ghostwriter. Well, tell me a little about that. How's that work? Um, actually, I have only one client, my, my long-term client, and it's more of a collaborative type of writing. Um, he... He comes up with the, the core idea. Together we write an outline, and I begin writing. Uh, he lives in Australia, so when I'm asleep, he's uh, editing the previous day's work, putting his own spin on it. Uh, when I'm awake, I edit his work because he was born um, in South Africa, and his first language isn't English. So although he's competent in English, it's not you know, sellable quality. So I edit his work and then um, start over for the next day. Uh, so it's quite collaborative, and uh, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Interesting. Interesting. Have you had other clients in the past, or has he been your only client? I've had other clients in the past. He and I actually started with nonfiction. Um, I edited several of his books first. 
and then I wrote a few more. And um, then he decided we should write fiction. And I've had a few fiction clients, I've had a few nonfiction clients, but I'm well past retirement age and I don't want to work full time. So uh, I do his writing that takes up to half a day depending on the budget for the month and that's all. Well, that must be an interesting lifestyle being a ghostwriter. You like it? I do. Um, it gives me an outlet for my creative side. Um, and it gives me time to be an entrepreneur, which I've been for more than 20 years. Uh, I use the other half of my time to be a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> what did you do before? Um, you mean when I worked for a living? <laughs> yeah, yeah, before you were a writer. Um, well, I, I ended up as a real estate agent, a uh, real estate broker in Utah. Um, I was I was that when the real estate bubble hit and uh, that took us down a lot of us who were small brokers uh, my husband joined the gig economy so that we could keep a roof over our heads and I couldn't work of course um, not licensed anywhere but Utah so that's when I began looking for a way to make money online which eventually led to the the Odesk profile and and the ghostwriting. I understand. It sounds like an interesting route to have taken. <laughs> that that year that we wandered was very interesting. We we were at um, national parks and monuments throughout the Southwest. It gave me quite a bit of fodder for some of my settings, mm -hmm. and um, gave me a great deal of interest in the Native American cultures that we encountered. It was uh, probably the biggest adventure of my life. What was your favorite national park? Um, we only were in one national park. Most of the time we were in national monuments. Okay. It was two days after my 63rd birthday that I climbed the highest peak in Texas, which right. isn't very high. <laughs> and um, I did that solo hike, and it was it was great. It was you could see forever once you get got to the top of it, um, and I still can't remember the name of it. Sorry. That's okay. I remember um, I I traveled all around the national parks after my wife passed away, on the Southwest. Mm -hmm. So I went to a lot of them, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I went through um, Texas, just the Panhandle. I think it's called the Panhandle, and the Guadalupe National Park. That's near on the way really? to um, Calico, yeah. or on the way to. Um, Caverns, um, Carlsbad okay. Caverns, yeah. That's it, Guadalupe. <laughs> yeah. Did you do much hiking? Uh, no, no, I didn't hike. I just got out and, and took some photos. I was on my way to the caverns. I've always liked caves. Uh huh. So I just stopped there because it was there, and it was interesting, and then moved on, and then spent three days in the caves. Wow. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not claustrophobic, so right. it was fun. You don't have to be close to, I mean, Carlsbad is huge. Um, I love to hike. It's probably my favorite thing after reading. So hiking up to the peak of Mount of Guadalupe was, uh, it was very exciting to me, even yeah. though I almost got blown off the mountain. <laughs> it's an interesting place. I like the Southwest. I like the deserts. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably going to write some stories that are based there at some point. Um, I hit the Grand Canyon several times, took the train. I hit uh, Joshua Tree 50 times. I love Joshua Tree. Wow, yeah. 50 times. Yeah, I got lost, you know, mm -hmm. fell down a mountain, all kinds of adventures. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm um, fascinated by a fellow traveler of the Southwest. That's very nice. We, we moved seven times in 2010. Okay. Spending a few weeks here and a few weeks there. We were at... Uh, Timpanogos National Monument. We were at um, uh, okay. My mind has gone blank again, but we we were at several. <laughs> it's no worries. It's no um, worries. And it was it was just so interesting to see the parks. I that year I got one of the um, senior passes so that I can 
we can go to more. And we've got one right ne right nearby, Colorado National Monument. Okay. Looks here year and haven't been there yet, but we're going tomorrow. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yes. Uh, what's your favorite memory about writing when you think about what you've done? Um, I, I thought about this. Uh, and the favorite, I think the favorite memory about writing was a time when I went on a retreat with the Colorado Romance Writers, uh, which is a chapter of the Romance Writers of America. Uh, we went up to Estes Park, which is near uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. And um, Estes Park is also the home of the hotel that was Stephen King's inspiration for the hotel he, he wrote about in The Shining. So we spent a long weekend there, um, six or seven of us, uh, had a great time, drank a lot of wine, did a little karaoke, and I wrote a novella that weekend, an entire story. So that was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Interesting. And can you tell us what it was about? What the novella was about? Yeah. Um, it was a lead magnet. Um, many of your writers need to know what that is. Uh, I intended it to be a free uh, offer for people who would sign up to my newsletter. And it was um, sort of a sequel to one of my romance novels. Um, it was about a, uh, a woman who w reluctantly went on a rafting trip down the Colorado River uh, through Grand Junction and into the Moab area where I grew up and some misadventures that happened along the way. Oh, interesting. Moab is near Arches National Park, isn't it? Correct. Arches is right outside Moab. I grew up in Moab. I've been there. Okay. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good. Um, and why did you choose romance? Big market, basically. Um, also, I didn't have time to, to research. So I needed something that didn't require much, if any, research. I, I ended up researching a few um, settings, but most of them were set in the southwest that, where, I, where I know the locations. Okay. Okay. Have you ever written any other kinds of novels, um, westerns or science fiction or anything like that? Well, the archaeological thrillers that my clients write um, has a bit of... I call it speculative fiction. It's it's based on reality or um, sometimes based on conspiracy theory, but I have always made an effort to make whatever we wrote plausible, even if it wasn't real. So, yeah, a little bit. Well, that, that's an important part of being a writer is being able to suspend the reader's disbelief. Exactly. I mean, warp drives don't exist, but we have Star Trek, and people believe it. <laughs> True. You know, teleport True. devices are on the edge of ridiculous as far as science is concerned, but we still believe it because it's in the story. If oh, the writer does a good job. Yes, beam me up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love Star Trek. The older ones, not the newer ones. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're old enough to recall Dick Tracy and his wrist radio. I do recall Dick Tracy. We've got those now, so who knows? Maybe we'll have teleporters. Yes. Okay. I'm still waiting for the lunar colony that was promised me when I was reading science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think I'm going to see one this lifetime. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. We'll right. Now, um, as far as other authors are concerned, you mentioned authors need to know about lead magnets. What are some good promotional techniques that authors should know know about and use? Well, the best one I've ever found, and it's true in the romance genre, I'm not sure about others, but in romance, if you're an indie published author, as I am, you better be putting out a book every four to six weeks. And romance uh, readers like book, their books to be 80,000 to 100,000 words, so you have to write pretty quickly. and fairly cleanly so that your editor doesn't take forever. Um, the next best way, as far as I'm concerned, is to have a list, and that's, that's just par for the course for whatever you're doing independently, whether it's writing or 
um, you know, selling things from China, you have to have an email list. And of course, a lead magnet is a way to exchange value for an email address. Um, so in the lead magnet, you basically give away um, a gift, a book in your case, or a novel, novella, novella mm -hmm. um, in return for an email address so that then you can send those people messages. Correct. And that attracts people to your list. Otherwise, why would they join up? Exactly. Because mm -hmm. there's got to be 50 billion lists out there. <laughs> At least. I think I belong to most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I use rules a lot and to, to automatically file things so I don't have to deal with them. Right. Because I don't really want to unsubscribe from a lot of them, mostly because I'm a copywriter also. So mm -hmm. I want to see what kind of copy comes for it, but I don't want to read them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they take some time. I'm on a lot of lists from friends. Uh, my, my friends are romance writers or, uh, well, they're all romance writers. Some of them are uh, fantasy romance, some of them are historical romance, there are a lot of flavors of romance and um, oddly enough romance isn't my favorite type of, of genre to read so I don't want to unsubscribe because that would make my friends wonder if I don't love them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've actually been thinking about writing a science fiction romance. Interesting, that's uh, that's making one of my friends quite a bit of money. She does publish a new short novel. It's probably around fifty to 60,000 words every single month, every four weeks. Yeah, I've been publishing um, short Kindle ebooks. They're 10,000 to 15,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, on average, uh, under pen names, one per week. Yeah, well, <laughs> so you can do the work. Yeah, well, that's, if you want to survive as a, a writer, you better be doing the work. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't make a living writing much less than 4, 4 k a week, or excuse me, a, a day, and uh, that's what I do. Yeah, I would say as, to be a professional writer, actually earning an income, 4,000 words is probably about the minimum. You, you need publishable mm -hmm. words every single day. Yeah. Or almost publishable, ready to send to the editor. Right. We... Of course, uh, my words are edited by my client and his are edited by me. So by the time it gets to a, an outside editor, it's pretty clean. Yes, so just to reinforce um, for those who are listening, a, an email list is the number one way to help build your tribe or your followers mm -hmm. out in the world, as you say. It, because you stay in contact with those readers and you send them updates about your books and about how you do and and what you're writing, as you're writing, you probably send little updates to them, mm -hmm. I would imagine, saying, I'm working on my new novel, and here's a couple paragraphs or something, and here's an adventure my character's having. You do stuff like that. I do. Um, sometimes I send outtakes. Sometimes I send uh, cover reveals. Mm -hmm. Just anything to keep my work top of mind for my readers. Um, and, of course, social media is a big help as well. Uh, you, I gained a, a following of about 50 hardcore readers who were posting my updates all over, the, all over Facebook. Um, I had to put a stop to it because Facebook began to uh, give, give authors slaps for that. But uh, it was nice to know that people valued the entertainment I gave them enough to, to promote me with no thought of reward. It was really heartwarming. Yeah, and, and I think the key thing that I'm hearing from you is you're not posting, buy my book. You're posting information or entertainment to help to cause your readers to want to talk to you or want to learn more about you or your stories. Absolutely. Um, buy my book never works on Facebook, and I, I see a lot of writers making, uh, wasting a lot of money using paid ads that go straight to their Amazon page. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a total waste of money. Uh, get them to your website where you can keep them. <laughs> right. When they sign up with Amazon, you don't own 
that email list, Amazon does. Precisely. Uh, the, the one thing I learned early in my entrepreneurial career is that anytime you are dependent on somebody else's platform, you don't own your business. It's, it's, it's job number one to own your business. Yeah, in fact, I teach courses on, on how to brand yourself as an author. And one of the things I tell people, which you just reinforced, is start with a blog. And that's your home. Everything goes there because Facebook can't close down your blog. Right. It doesn't matter. I mean, unless you're going way wacko on your blog and doing something really weird, um, the, the host isn't going to shut you down just because you said a naughty word or two. Right. And, and you can't do that on Facebook. You can't do it on Facebook. Um, Amazon can delete your account for any reason or no reason, as many romance authors are finding. Um, any platform that isn't yours is vulnerable to somebody else's whim. Correct. Yeah, and, and of course, even your web host is vulnerable to, to their whim, but they're a lot less vulnerable than other things. And you can always create a backup and go to a new host. Absolutely. Uh, which you should be doing all the time. I see so many writers crying on social media that their uh, their hard drive has died and they've lost their last novel that was almost finished. Back it up daily, please. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think in the description I'll put a link to a program called Carbonite that does automatic backups of hard drives. Mm -hmm. That everybody, in my opinion, should own that product or one like it because there's also Live Drive, which is what I use. Mm -hmm because it's automatic, it backs up everything you do. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to worry about it. And I've lost hard drives, there it is. So have I, uh, fortunately all of my work is backed up on Dropbox. So yeah. uh, because of the collaborative nature of our work, my client and I use Dropbox to mm -hmm. send, send our files, or to actually keep our files in one place. And that, and that stores them in what's called the cloud, which is Offsite, something out in the the world that somebody else has, and that's what I used to do for a living. So, but this is <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. We um, have no more in common than you know. I used to be an IT an IT specialist at a hospital in uh, near Washington D.C. Well, we could have very long talks about this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, in another interview. <laughs> some other time, sure. Let's. Yeah, I used to be in IT for Trader Joe's. So. Oh, cool! I love Trader Joe's. Yeah. Um, so you're you're you practice what's called the what I call the writing life, which is you're self-employed, and you're your own boss, and you make your own rules. Other than, of course, what your clients want. Your, your clients really are boss, um, but you can turn down clients and things if you want. Uh, what do you enjoy about the writing life besides? Well, just what do you enjoy about the writing life, and what is it? to you? Well, to begin with, it was freedom. Um, and, and that goes for any home-based type of income generation. Um, I wanted to be able to do my work when I was at my most productive and rest when I wanted to and so forth. Of course, I came late to that, that life. I was already retired. Um, however, uh, one of the things I enjoy the most uh, about how I'm living now is my collaboration with my client. He and I chat on Skype daily. Um, we finish each other's sentences. <laughs> um, he's, he's a very funny man and a very generous man. And, and when you said something about your client is your boss, I quite frequently argue with mine because he is a project manager. He's not a writer, although he does write. Um, one of the things I learned quite quickly as, as soon as he persuaded me to write fiction is that I, I needed some education on the craft, and I have taken the opportunity to get it, so I argue with him a lot over how the scenes should go and, you know, Various things having to do with pacing the novel, that's the most frequent argument we have. He's good-natured. He gives in sometimes. <laughs> yes, I, I actually have several clients like that, but I call it book coaching rather than ghostwriting. 
Uh huh. Okay. Well, because I write, a, you know, nine tenths of the book, he he usually contributes a few sentences or changes a word here and there. Sure. I call it ghost writing. <laughs> well, it's I, it's kind of ghost book coaching, I guess, but it's the same <laughs> same, same concept. Only um, for go, book coaching, I charge by the hour, and ghost writing, I typically fix price it. Oh, really? Yeah. I charge by the word. Okay. I, I know how many words I can write per hour and what I want to make per hour, so I make it work out. Yeah, it's basically the same concept as you're charging a rate based on time or production. Mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes me and my customer will just talk for the whole hour uh, that we, we have a session every day, and we don't write anything because we're working on plot. And uh -huh. Sometimes we write, and it goes really well. Anyway, um, this is supposed to be about you, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, I fix price the plot. We, okay. we determine that we'll take so many days or a week or whatever we think it will take and um, fix price for that time. And I spend the amount of time during that week that also gets me my hourly rate. So okay. working out. Well, you're, you're reinforcing something that I like to stress to, to especially beginning writers, is the, if you have the skill of writing, you can turn that into income, not just through your books, but through ghostwriting and copywriting and writing blogs and doing all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're taking advantage of those skills. Oh, absolutely. I edited for a while. I've proofread. Um, I have an English major. Uh, unfortunately without a, an education degree so <laughs> it opened doors during my working life but as far as making an income now I'm doing all sorts of things including uh, developing an online course mm -hmm. that's not about writing but about writers being productive okay okay yeah that's that's an interesting point um, when I hear writers saying they they sometimes think they're doing really good when they write 500 words in a week. It's like you're not going to make it making 500 words in a week. You might be proud of that, and it might be something to be proud of because you did you did something, mm -hmm. but you need to be doing a lot more than that to actually make a living at writing. It's certainly, if making a living is your goal, uh, and not all not all writers have making a living as their goal. Of course, uh, but uh, you know. I would venture a guess that at least half of those who say they don't care whether they make any money are lying to themselves. Um, you know, it's it's not uh, it is work. It's not it's not something that you would want to do day in and day out just for pleasure. Part part of the pleasure is seeing your words in print and, or you know on an e-reader at least. And and having other people read them, so writing 500 words a week, you're right. That's not going to cut it. That's why that's why writers say that it took them 10 years to write their novel. And in this day and age, that's ridiculous. You can't you can't write a a, a current novel if you're doing it over 10 years. Very true, especially when you get into more technical type novels like science fiction or even fantasy. I mean, the, the novels have changed. They have. It's like yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones changed fantasy and mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings movie and stuff. And it's very different now than it was when I was growing up. When I was in, in high school, we read Charles Dickens. Uh, people today probably can't even read Charles Dickens any better than I was able to read Chaucer. I mean, you struggle through it, but it's so different. The the tropes are different. The the, the language is different. Right. Well, you used a word there that might be unfamiliar. Um, what does trope mean to to you? Um, in romance, it's um, friends to to lovers, or it's um, um, you know. Good girl meets bad boy and and changes him for the better. Right. In romantic suspense, it's um, 
female detective um, surprises male detective by being smarter than he is, or female detective gets in trouble and is rescued by male detective. <laughs> so, there are very many uh, new ideas out there. What's what's out there? What's what's important about your writing is that you bring your own knowledge and and twist to it so that even if it's something if it, even if the trope is one that someone has read a hundred or a thousand times before they still enjoy the story because you've brought your voice you've brought your um, your take on how the characters would act and feel and express themselves exactly exactly yeah you can turn a common trope into something unique because you're unique and you just use your skill. Mm -hmm. um, how do you fight writer's block? Um, I don't believe in writer's block. <laughs> um, I'm a very organized writer. I write from an outline uh, more often than not. Uh, so I never sit down without knowing what I need to write that day. And because I know what I need to write, I don't stare at a blank screen wondering what to write. Um, one time in my life during a year when I had a series of very upsetting events culminating in my mother's passing, um, I was unable to write the book that I was trying to write that, that year. Um, and I say that year because I kept trying to write it even though I was terribly distracted by all these upsetting events. So as far as I'm concerned, writer's block is either being unprepared or being distracted by something that's too important to just set aside. Um, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess the solution would be find out what's distracting you and become undistracted. Uh, if that's possible. Um, you know, the, the events I'm talking about were not possible to set aside. Of course. So I set aside the, the writing. Um, when I picked it up again, I found that my inspiration for the book I was trying to write, the one time in, the, in my life that I've tried to pants it instead of plot it, <laughs> I just didn't have that book in, in, in me anymore. So uh, that's when I actually went back to ghostwriting. I contacted my client and said, you know, you still have work for me, and he jumped at it, and that's the way it's been ever since. Interesting. Yeah, I'm a complete pantser. I just sit down and write, and it's done. Is that right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I applaud it. <laughs> it's fine. We each have our methods. Uh, well, and, you know, to, to be honest, I think I've gone closer to that. I used to take a beat sheet, and um, it's kind of a... Uh, a combination between um, the, the Save the Cat beat sheet by Blake, whatever his name was, and, um, and the Snowflake method. So I, I had it down to a numerical science, and I had a one-sentence description of each scene and how many words I was going to write in that scene until I got the book completely plotted out. The trouble with that was um, I usually had to had to make some revisions because the characters don't always behave the way you expect them to. <laughs> so toward the last half of the book, I, I was constantly replotting. But um, these days, it's a uh, it's a loose chapter by chapter plot. You just said something interesting that I hear from a lot of um, experienced writers is that the characters write the book for you in some ways. The little stinkers. <laughs> yeah, they just they just take over, and it's like, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> exactly. Um, I've described to my my client that the way I write is I I look at what I'm supposed to write, and then I start the movie movie in my head and write down what happens. And um, so I guess I am, you know, moving toward pantsing, and I I think maybe that's maybe that's okay for an experienced writer. Um, I've written a couple of million words now. I think I know how to pace a novel. 
and uh, but before I didn't. I, I knew nothing about novel writing when I started writing fiction, which is why I disavow some of the early books. Yes, yes. Um, one thing that you seem to be good at, at least it's my impression, based on some of our conversations on Quora, is networking. And based on our conversation before this, uh, how, do, how should writers network with other writers, or should they network with other writers, and if so, how should they do it? Oh, absolutely. Um, just, you know, to, to tell a story on myself, when I started writing, I not only knew nothing about how to pace or, or a novel, how to grow a character or anything of that sort, I also thought that I could edit my own books because my mechanics are very good. Uh, it wasn't until I joined CRW that I was shamed into um, being a professional. And uh, not in a mean way. It was, it was my shame. Uh, people would say to me, what, you don't have an editor? Like it was, um, you know, just unheard of. <laughs> Well, you, you and I both know, especially if you've read a lot of indies who haven't taken advantage of an editor or a proofreader, you, you can't edit your own books. It just, you don't see your mistakes. So there was a lot of growth in professionalism by networking. Um, there's a lot of support by networking. Um, other, other writers know what you're going through. Um, other writers helped me through that terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year just by saying, you know, you'll get back to writing. Don't worry about it. Just take care of things and your readers will be there when you get back. And unfortunately, I don't know. I never published another book under my own pen name. But I still have readers uh, who message me, private message me on Facebook to ask how I'm doing. So, Yes, yes. I, I find networking to be critical. I found, like I said, you on Quora. And I found writers on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all over the place, or you know, even live in, in real life in, in the professional world. Yeah. So writing critique groups. Um, and it's very important that we have this camaraderie with other writers, partially because they can help promote our books, partially because, as you said, they serve as a, as a support group in a mm -hmm. way, and we can learn the craft of writing from each other. I learned a lot just by talking to you today. Um, we can really? spread, spread the word, you know. Mm -hmm. We can, all kinds of things. Um, I belonged to a mastermind group that was a subgroup of the CRW, um, we were all indie published or wanting to be indie published and we exchanged ideas for just that aspect of, of writing and publishing. Uh, I learned a lot from them. I hope they learned a lot from me. It's, it's critical. It's critical. You can't write in a vacuum. Meetup is another good place to find networking, especially locally. Yeah, I actually have a writing critique group on Meetup, a science fiction group we meet once a week. Um, yeah, it, it's important. To ha you can certainly write without a writing group, but you just can't promote without writers because writers help you get your books out there. And we should be helping each other. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my feeling is that the more we help each other, the more we sell more books and we, the more we get the word out about whatever we're writing. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Uh, it's true in every aspect of business I've ever endeavored to, to be in. Um, there's plenty of room for everybody out there as long as everybody plays nicely with others. Exactly. Well, it's been fun talking to you. We're, we're at about 45 minutes so far. Um, do you have any closing remarks? Um, well, as, as I mentioned to you before, I am working on a, an online course about writing productivity. And it's, it's mostly aimed at uh, female writers. And the reason for that is uh, many female writers wear 
all the hats, not only in their writing career, but also in their personal lives. They're the caregivers for their children. They're the chauffeurs. They're the shoppers and the house cleaners and everything else. Um, and if they're indie, they're also the publisher and the promoter and you know possibly the cover artist. Who knows? Um, it's a lot to take on. And throughout my entrepreneurial 20 years, I've learned some lessons on how to be productive without being overwhelmed. So that's the, the um, topic of my course, and I'm researching. Uh, I, I realize that not everyone is, has the same situation as I do, so I'm researching, and to do that, I'm interviewing writers, um, half-hour interviews that they can book at their convenience, and I would love if any of your listeners would find me on Facebook. Uh, they can find me at Sherry, C-H-E-R-I dot MERS, M-E-R-Z, um, on Facebook, and uh, just private message me and say they're willing to have an interview. So I've been interviewing Cheryl MERS, and a fascinating interview, a fellow ghostwriter, um, which I didn't know before we started, so I'm finding that fascinating. Uh, and if you like this video, we're going to be doing them twice a week, so be sure and subscribe, which is this button down below this thing and get uh, notifications whenever a new video comes out. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming, Cheryl. Thank you.